Today we're going to be talking about political parties in Texas. Now, if you're new to Texas, uh, you might be surprised to find out it's basically been a, a one-party state for quite some time. But it's been that way for a pretty long time. As a matter of fact, um, in its original history, it kind of flipped from one to the other, but it's basically been the whole state kind of falls behind one particular political party. Um, to completely understand this, we're going to talk about the history of Texas to, to get an idea of kind of how we got to this place um, today. Um, it started off in the in the beginning, a little before the Civil War, so before, um, slightly before Texas actually became a state um, of the United States, um, and it was a territory, there was disagreements um, as to what political party or philosophy they should actually fall under. So what they did in the very beginning, um, which was a process that is kind of continued today, but kind of evolved into different factions and how it actually works. But uh, the way it originally started off was um, rather than being ideological, such as um, liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, um, what it started off with was more um, personality based. So the leaders of the, the state or the country then, because um, it was a country at that time, or it was becoming a country, uh, were literally behind specific people. And so we've heard the, the name Sam Houston, um, has a city named after him. Uh, and so he started, basically he was like the main power base for a long time and there was some struggle against him. Um, so it challenged him, but for the most part, he kind of controlled a lot of what was actually going on in Texas. So right up until the Civil War, um, it was basically Sam Houston and um, as a Congress member, a senator, a governor. Um, and so basically he was a representative. And then when Texas decided to join the Southern states, um, which Texas has always kind of considered itself more of a Southern state rather than um, ideological on any specific uh, kind of bent. And so what it tends to uh, focus on, at least back then, is it was a very strong slavery state. And the slave states were seceding from the Union, so they left the Union and Texas left with them. Um, Sam Houston decided he didn't like that and he wanted to stay with the system. And as governor at that time, um, what happened was the government of Texas decided he was no longer properly, properly representing Texas. So basically they put the lieutenant governor in charge and that became the new governor of, of Texas. It'd be years later before um, Sam Houston got his power base back again, but that would be after the Civil War is over and we run into what's called a reconstruction. And Reconstruction is kind of really important to understand because it changed the dynamic of the political structure in Texas. So before then, the Texas political party was mostly the Democrat party, the Democratic party. And so it, it controlled pretty much everything. But the Democratic party of then is a lot different than the Democratic party of today. And it's kind of important to understand kind of where their, their ideological makeup exists to, to kind of see where changes happened. Um, for one thing, the Democrats then are kind of now the Republicans of today. So a lot of the same ideas that Republicans have today are the same ideas that Democrats had way back then. And so that's kind of part of what's called a realignment. And that happens right about the Civil War, and then we have another realignment that happened in the 1960s. Um, sadly enough, the, the reason for realignments, at least in this country, have tended to be more, wrong, more along racial guidelines or racial lines. And so when the uh, Civil War came along, uh, again, it was slavery, so again, a, a racial situation. 
Um, and then when a when the the civil rights movement occurred in the 1960s, um, the Republican Party kind of espoused the ideas of what the old Democrats did. And so a lot of the Southern states became Republican states, if that makes any sense. So basically that's kind of what happens back then. So during reconstruction, when the Republican party is actually in charge of the government, of the federal government, um, they institute a, a number of uh, draconian issues towards um, the Southern states to get them back into the system. But before they'd let them back into the system, they had to adopt all sorts of different rules, um, the new constitutional amendments that were added to the Constitution, um, stuff like that. And basically, it took many, many years for them to kind of get to some semblance of parity within the, the country to make that sort of thing happen. Um, so basically, from 1874, because the Civil War ends 1865, 1865 um, from 1874 to about 1961, um, there's a strong democratic rule um, throughout uh, Texas. And like I said, it's not the same Republic or Democrats that we have today. It's a different kind of a Democrat party. So once you kind of understand that, it kind of helps going forward on how these kind of things, these things work. Um, but in, in 1984, um, well, for, like I said, we had the realignment process. So we had two different realignments. The second one was in the 1960s, um, which caused a huge split in both the Democrats and Republicans. So a lot of Republican, I'm sorry, a lot of Democrats became Republicans and most of the state went from a democratic state to a republican state. Um, part of this is due to, again, remember how I mentioned what's really important for Texas is it has a tendency of doing um, more identity politics than um, ideological politics. So we had a, a senator at that time by the name of Phil Graham. This was in so this takes a little, a few years. So 1960s, um, we start slow change, but then about 20 years later in 1984, um, Phil Graham, um, who basically didn't win during the uh, during a, a nomination process, um, and basically wasn't supported by a lot of the, um, the the policy or processes that he was trying to get uh, enacted. Um, and like I said, he was a Democrat at the time, um, decided to switch political parties. And basically, it didn't give the Democrats enough time to actually field another opponent. And so basically, when he ran for the same position as a Republican, he won again as a Republican and basically kind of switched that seat to a Republican seat. It's kind of been that way. There have been a few little changes here and there, but mostly it's been consistent going forward. And then a number of years later, which is about 10 years, in 1994, um, Texas basically took, I, I'm sorry, the Republican Party basically took control of the, of the Texas everything. So House, Senate, all, all everything. And it's pretty much been very one-sided ever since. So when this one party rule uh, came about in Texas, remember, it's always been kind of a one party state anyway. It just happened to be Democrat before, and now it happened to be, now it happens to be Republican. So it, it could move the other direction because Texas doesn't have a whole lot of uh, diversity built into its political structure which means it tends to focus on one way or the other. And so it's kind of the mood of the state as to see kind of where it was actually going. We kind of ran into um, a potential, um, not split, but a potential changeover um, when Ted Cruz was running for re-election for the U.S. Senate. Um, he ran against uh, Beto O'Rourke, who was a Democrat. Now, 
in most situations, you'd think there's no chance of Beto O'Rourke to actually win because Democrats have very little viable chance in Texas. But what happened was um, he got far stronger numbers than anyone actually suspected he would, but it still went to Ted Cruz, meaning the state has maintained a basically a red, when you're talking about red and blue, um, blue being Democrats, red being Republicans, um, it's maintained red. And so I have a graphic that actually shows kind of the entire red um, population of the state as in um, control, and it's massive in this state. And so it will stay this way until there's some kind of realignment to cause things to go the other direction. And it may, because there's a number of things kind of leading the state to do that particular thing. Um, one is um, basically national politics. If national politics tend to sway the state to think one way or the other, like the current president may actually cause a whole segment of the population to vote against anything dealing with that particular party. Now, this can happen in any type of election year um, based on the events of kind of how things are actually happening. Um, there was a slight chance of that actually happening during the George W. Bush years because there's a lot of um, adversity and um, uh, very dislike of um, the policies that the national government was taking at that time. So there was a, a thought that maybe there would be a, an attempt to switch basically Texas to a blue state. Didn't happen. Um, Texas has stayed um, strong um, red since, or even before that. Um, and part of the reason for that was, is um, especially during that period, is Bush was a really popular president and popular with the state. So it's really hard to actually flip something like that during that kind of a process. At the current moment, anything could happen because the current leaders, while they, they are a power base, base um, part, part of the problem that we've run into right now is they're not a consistent power base, meaning people may swing one or the other direction depending on whether or not something causes them to think this might be a better direction to go. Um, but so far, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, um, especially with uh, all sorts of other um, alternative kind of situations happening in, in the current dilemma, which um, even viruses and all this other kind of stuff that kind of affect the way things are actually occurring on the, the national stage. So what happens in the next couple of months could make a big difference you know, by the time we get to the actual November election, or it may have zero influence on it, depending on kind of how people are at that particular time, how the economy is doing, all those sorts of things as well. One of the other factors that's actually really important to, to focus on when we get closer to the, uh, the, the next election and future elections is there's a growing Hispanic population in Texas. And quite often to the behest of many um, political parties is they've just ignored it. And historically, the Republican Party has ignored the Hispanic population. And as a result, um, they've lost a lot of the power base behind that. Well, the forward-moving Republicans of the state have been, I guess, a little more uh, um, coherent or um, cognizant of the fact that uh, this is actually happening here and there's nothing they can do about it to, to stop it. And I think have now embraced the idea that they shouldn't stop it, but should actually embrace it and do something for it, um, are now kind of trying to entice Hispanic voters. So there's a strong chance that the Hispanic population based off of uh, outreaches of both parties may actually grow in both parties, meaning their effect may be somewhat negligible. So, which leads us to the idea of third parties in Texas, because we've talked about the Republicans and the Democrats, 
like I said, the state is a mostly a Republican state these days. But um, the Democrats may actually turn the state blue. But at the other time, at the other moment, there's a uh, another situation that's been kind of in the background for the longest time, and that's third parties in Texas. And part of the interesting part of that is mostly they're not viable. They've never really been viable. I mean, there's a Libertarian Party, there's a Green Party, there, you had the uh, Ross Perot's um, party who came along and basically didn't really do anything other than it, it got some votes. Um, so what it ends up doing is if a third party candidate is actually running, he or she will end up uh, trying to get ideas out there. So hopefully one of the two main parties picks them up and adopts that as part of their platform, which makes third parties tend to be more issue generated. And which also means they don't get a whole lot done and they don't get a whole lot out of the system. So what ends up happening is third parties tend to adopt the ideas of a particular party, one of the two main parties, and then kind of become folded into that particular party. There was, and, and so that generally works out pretty well. And if it works out in the best scenario for at least one of the two political parties is they adopt that third party before the actual election and the election doesn't affect any of the actual votes. So if a, a third party candidate comes along like the Green Party did um, with uh, Ralph Nader running the party at that time. Now, the Democrats at that time could have espoused a lot of their ideas, taken their thoughts and said, this is what we're gonna do. And then basically would have made them almost a a non-name by the time they got to the actual election, but they didn't do that. And basically fought the Green Party, um, stated that it was not you know, viable, couldn't, uh, couldn't make a difference, and basically wasn't a good thing, and was against democracy, came up with all these kind of excuses or um, criticisms. And so what ended up happening was the, uh, ref the reform. Reform was Ross Perot's party. But the, the Green Party ended up taking a lot of votes that could have gone to a, to a Democrat. Um, and so basically, when you need um, votes to offset the other party, when you have two political parties, um, you need as many votes as you physically can get. So any vote that goes to a third party means it's not somebody voting for one of the two particular parties, which means if there's somebody that's more ideological like you, you've lost votes for your particular party. So quite often the argument is made that a third party tends to throw away a vote, but I kind of go with a different direction on that. As I see it more as um, it's not the, uh, the third party, it's not the voter who's throwing away their vote by going for a third party. It's the main parties who are losing the vote by causing people to actually vote for a third party. So the, the onus should be actually on the, the parties themselves to bring those third party people back into their fold. But if they don't do that, then it's really their fault. And they've lost the votes based off of not having a strong enough viable message in order to get people interested in whoever their actual candidate is. So now that we've talked about third parties um, and why they're generally not very viable other than kind of as idea generators, um, which leads us to uh, the idea of party organizations. Now you have political parties, but you can't just have them in name only. So we have basically two kinds of um, organizations built within the, the party structure, at least for the two main political parties. And the third parties tend to kind of adopt something similar, but sometimes takes a little more work than, or they're sometimes use outside kinds of things. Like Ross Perot, um, his reform party, was more about him top heavy, which meant he wasn't really looking for organization and kind of how to, how, how to make it work for the, 
the larger group as opposed to how it would work for him. So when you had other people running under his party banner, like uh, Jesse Ventura, um, what they ended up having to do is literally kind of steal a bit of the, um, the limelight of the, the organization to get things done. And so it became very difficult. It's kind of why the party, or at least one of the major reasons why the party doesn't exist as a viable thing going forward. Because part of what you actually need as one of these um, third parties, you need a certain percentage in order to participate in the actual election. So if you don't get that percentage, and you don't maintain that percentage in the, pre in the next previous election going forward, that means you're not even seen on the ballot. You end up having to be a write-in on the ballot, which makes it really, really difficult for you to get your name anywhere. And so um, you end up becoming Mickey Mouse on the, uh, on the ballot, which is somebody just writing it in there. And so anyway, uh, so getting back to the organizations themselves, for at least the two main ones, um, they'll have specific um, positions so the organization doesn't like fall apart during the, the times when you're not actually having an election. And so you'll have the precinct chair, which is um, controlling a, a local area kind of a thing. You'll have county chairs, you'll have the county executive committee, um, you'll have the state executive committee, and basically the state chair. Those are like, they have to be there. They're the, the permanent parts of the party organization. but at the same time, when elections come along, there's a whole lot of people that have to do a whole lot of different things. So that's when you have temporary party organizations. So like I said, you have a precinct chair, but that precinct will actually run what's called the precinct convention. And so those kind of get together to make sure who's actually running. Um, count the county or senatorial districts will have their own committee and the state conventions themselves actually exist as kind of a temporary party organization because they'll run this huge get together in order to decide this is the person we're running for political office. Sometimes it'll be for um, individual positions, but most of the time it's for like the national uh, election that's actually taking place. Um, our presidential primaries in Texas because um, not every state has to do it the same way. Um, they usually do it either through a, um, a primary, um, which is just basically an election before, um, and then that decides your candidates, uh, which is each party voting for their person, and then that person gets sent to the national election. Um, or they'll have what's called a caucus, which is um, a huge get-together of people just um, deciding, hey, this is who we actually want to run for, for office. And quite often it's a popularity contest. There's uh, some arguments being made. And, um, one of the arguments made is that uh, like religious organizations really are pro caucus rather than primaries because primaries rely on actual getting, getting out the vote. Whereas a caucus requires getting people together in one group, which churches are really, really good at doing. So, of course, that would be the direction they'd actually want to go. So if you're a strong pro-religious um, organization, chances are you're going to be supporting a caucus rather than an actual primary. It doesn't matter which political party. It's just that's going to benefit you in the long run. In Texas, we have something a little different than a lot of other states, and even gave it a Texas name. We call it the Texas Two-Step. So first we start off with a primary. So we get together, we do, do the big vote, and then that party goes to an actual caucus and then gathers all the people together and decides amongst, um, from the, the votes they got in the primary, who then wins going and then becomes the actual candidate for the election going forward. Um, part of the problem we've run into in Texas is, not a lot of people are all familiar with the whole process. We don't vote as much as we think we do. Um, people have a tendency of, you know, showing up to vote and that's pr pretty much it. And then don't think anything about it after that. Well, that became a real problem during the last election because 
people showed up to the caucus and had no idea what they were actually doing. They thought they were actually coming to vote twice. Like they had voted once during the primary and now they're voting again. This makes no sense to them. And so some people actually, once they found out a caucus can be an all day affair, like starting off in the morning and then going off into like late, late at night, kind of went, you know, I got things to do. I'm, I'm heading to work in the morning or whatever their, their, their excuse was. And they basically left. So impatience literally served one candidate over the other. Um, in the last major um, presidential election, um, before the, um, the recent election, so um, Obama versus Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton pretty much won the primary for Texas. And what ended up happening was during the caucus, the two-step, Texas two-step, um, what happened was um, Barack Obama actually managed to get more votes out of the caucus and ended up pulling like five votes ahead, five or six votes ahead of, of Hillary Clinton, whereas before he'd actually lost the actual election. So just to show you kind of how sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes maybe that's the way the system was designed to make it actually happen. So that's pretty much all I have to say for today's lesson. Um, hopefully you got something out of it and I'll talk to you next time.